Hello, my name is Niall Jefferson and welcome to this podcast in the ENT Expert Opinion Series. The topic of this podcast is airway balloon dilatation and our guest expert is Professor Michael Rudder. Professor Rudder is the Director of Clinical Research at Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Centre and the, at the University of Cincinnati College of Medicine in the United States. He is known internationally for his expertise in management of congenital tracheal stenosis, paediatric aspiration and paediatric sleep apnea, as well as adult airway disease and management of the complex airway. Thanks for joining us, Mike. My pleasure, Niall. Let's begin. What, what is balloon dilatation and what does it offer us? In some senses, balloon dilatation has been around for a long time, but most of this has originally been in the radiology literature. Small numbers of case reports, usually done on kids with tracheal rings, where something had already gone wrong operatively and they're trying to salvage a situation. And interestingly, that's where it started for us. The, uh, the history is that in February of 2001, one of my cardiothoracic colleagues and I, uh, Peter Manning, uh, we did our first slide tracheoplasty uh, in the middle of the race riots in Cincinnati, as it happens. And um, it went very well, but this was a girl who post-operatively developed a figure eight trachea, a slight bunching of the anastomosis. And nowadays I know that that usually spontaneously improves with time on its own, but back then I did not know that, and I was very concerned about the appearance of the trachea. And she had a subglottic stenosis, a mild congenital one. It was enough that a 3 endotracheal tube could fit through it. I didn't feel a need to repair it, but it meant that I couldn't get a bougie through her subglottis that was big enough to do anything to the trachea, whether we're talking a Maloney dilator or a cattail dilator um, or an endotracheal tube, there was nothing that was making an impression on the bunching of the anastomosis in the trachea. And so I actually thought about trying to use a balloon, went to the cadaver lab, and I, I tried fairly hard to explode a trachea in a cadaver and failed, and I thought, well, why not? And so we balloon dilated this girl two or three times. It seemed to work pretty well. In retrospect, I think it would have worked anyway, but there you go. And that sort of sowed the seed, and we started finding that we were balloon dilating more and more children for more and more reasons. And in the subsequent sort of 12 years or so, we're closing in on 2,000 airway balloon dilations at this point in time. With that information, how about we define who, who is balloon dilatation suitable for? Which, which ages can we start using it at? Is there a specific pathology to which it's tailored? Um, and which locations are we able to address? How far can we take this? The ages are almost irrelevant. It's the pathology you're dealing with. And the concept here is the concept of the laryngotracheal skeleton. If the exoskeleton of your airway, your cartilage skeleton of your airway, is intact, then this is a good option for dealing with an intraluminal problem. So, say, intraluminal scar, where the outer cartilage framework is okay, that's the ideal case to do a balloon dilation. If you've got a skeleton problem, say you've got an elliptical cricoid, or you've got complete tracheal rings, or you are missing cartilage, you've got a malacic airway without cartilage. These things are not good candidates for balloon dilation unless you're willing to do something else at the same time. For example, with an elliptical cricoid, you could split the cricoid and then balloon dilate it. But the ideal candidate has got a normal exoskeleton of the airway and you're dealing with intraluminal scar. And age is almost irrelevant in terms of where you can balloon dilate. Like any hammer, the more you use it, the more indications you can come up with. So we can use it in the nose for outfracturing the inferior turbinate. We can use it to dilate a coanal atresia repair that's starting to reach the nose. 
We can use it to dilate the pharynx or the esophagus, though typically the most common places we use it are in the subglottis and the trachea and occasionally the bronchi. So you've answered elements of the next question, but beyond the uh, physical constraints, are there any elements in the, the history or based on the investigations that you, that you have before you that makes a patient a good candidate for a balloon dilatation? I think the key here is partly choosing the patient, but also partly choosing the appropriate size balloon. And again, so much of what we currently know about balloons has yet to be rigorously proven in an animal model. And so we don't know how long the balloon should be inflated. We don't know what diameter is the best size. We don't know what pressure. We don't know when we should redilate. We don't know how often we should redilate. And all of these things will become clearer as time goes by. And so in terms of the selection of the balloon for the patient, it's always useful to have a guideline And guidelines are purely that. You then modify it to account for the circumstances. So the guideline I use is to take a child's age-appropriate endotracheal tube, look at the outer diameter, and add one millimeter for luck for the larynx and two millimeters for luck for the trachea. So for example, if I had a four-year-old child, a four-year-old should take a 5-0 endotracheal tube. The outer diameter on a 5O endotracheal tube is pretty close to 7 millimeters. And so I would use preferentially an 8 millimeter balloon for the larynx and a 9 millimeter balloon for the trachea. Then you take into account circumstance. If they've got a very tight stenosis, you might start smaller, and maybe the second dilation you might move up a size. If they've recently had an airway reconstruction, you're going to use a smaller balloon at a lower pressure than you would in someone who's got a fixed long-standing scar. How do you consent the parents um, for something like this? We've actually got, and, and this was, I must admit, a stroke of genius many years ago, where whenever we do a look at the airway, so the term we use is a microlaryngoscopy and bronchoscopy, we also have the ubiquitous rider with endoscopic intervention as indicated. Because we found that, you know, some kid had a little bit of granulation and there would inevitably be some do-gooder in the OR who would insist we'd have to go out and get a new consent form so we could remove a bit of granulation tissue. And you'd find that parents are in the cafeteria and you're waiting for 10 minutes. And so we added the endoscopic intervention as indicated. So basically, effectively, I can do whatever the hell I want whenever I want to do it and no one bitches about it. And this has worked really well for us. And so if I know I'm going to balloon dilate someone, then we'll add with balloon dilation. But if I do a bronchoscopy and I see something that would really benefit from balloon dilation, there's nothing to stop me going ahead and doing it. And most of these families, I have discussed the various options of what we might find and might do ahead of time, but the consent form covers all of those possibilities with that ubiquitous statement. Are there any specific risks that you would discuss with the family in direct relation to a balloon dilatation? What I usually tell them is that um, the first time I dilate them, we're going to, and, and we're, say, with a child who doesn't have a tracheotomy tube. So the first time I dilate them, they're going to spend the night in hospital just to be sure there's no swelling. And it's very rare that there is. The second time, if they did well the first time, they will do well the second time, and the second time we do it as an outpatient, unless they had a problem the first time. Okay. And if they've got a tracheotomy tube and I'm dilating proximal to the tracheotomy tube, it can still be as an outpatient. Are there any specific investigations that you must have before you would consider dilating someone? No. Good. Um, Are there specific staff or equipment 
that you need? We've already touched on how you select the tube, but is there anything else that you've found makes the process easier? There are a few things that you should bear in mind. And so firstly, you need to be collaborative with your anaesthetists. They need to understand what you're doing. And ideally, they're trying to hyperventilate the patient before you inflate the balloon, because once the balloon's inflated, they've got a completely occluded airway. They need to be deeply enough anaesthetized that they're not going to start bucking on an inflated balloon with a relative risk of negative pressure pulmonary edema. Interestingly, I've never seen that happen to a child, but there has been the occasional case report in adults. And so usually what we do is give the patient a burst of propofol. Um, and so that's the white stuff, Jackson juice, whatever you want to call it. But uh, a bolus of propofol, diprofen, and um, then we inflate the balloon. And usually we'll leave the balloon inflated for either two minutes or till the oxygen saturations hit 90%, whichever happens first, and then we deflate the balloon. The reason for two minutes is that if you look at the pressure gauge on the balloon, and, and these are very high pressure balloons, you know, up to 20 atmospheres, you'll see the needle drifting. You keep having to add liquid for about 90 seconds, and that's presumably as the stenosis is slowly stretching out. If you do the balloon on the bench outside the patient, the needle doesn't drift. And so something's happening while the needle's drifting. And so I tend to use two minutes to get past that time where the fibrosis is actually stretching. In terms of the personnel, apart from the anaesthetic personnel, this is effectively a three-man job. So it's typically me and either a resident or a fellow and one of our nurses. And so typically... One of our, say, residents is placing the balloon. They've got an anaesthetic laryngoscope blade in their left hand. They place the balloon with their right hand into the right part of the airway. I then hold the shaft of the balloon. They get a bronchoscope or just a Hopkins rod telescope and insert it so we can directly see where the balloon is sitting. And then I ask the nurse to inflate the balloon. And the balloon is then inflated to the rate of burst pressure. You've got to be very careful of watermelon seeding. These balloons are quite slippery, and you don't want it to shoot away from you. And so if it's starting to move in the wrong position, you just deflate the balloon, reposition it, and reinflate it. And um, you hold it at the rated pressure as long as you choose to do, the sort of two minutes, then deflate it, remove it, have a look, often reintubate to give the child a few quick breaths. So uh, that probably helps clarify, but initially you would uh, intubate the child, um, breathe them appropriately, and then go in with a balloon? Not always, in the sense that um, often we will do that, but some kids, frankly, can't be intubated because their stenosis can be quite impressive. And again, if they've got a tracheotomy, that's not a problem. If they don't, then you're having to hold a mask on their face and do a, basically a long, slow induction mm -hmm. as you slowly get them deeper and try and blow off as much CO2 as possible, get their oxygen sats as high as you can, and then balloon them. And in some kids, we'll sometimes have the balloon up just for 10 seconds to be able to then intubate, get them deeper, and then go in and do a more comprehensive dilation. Are there any specific post-operative instructions for the, people, the children that you've dilated? Most of the time, we um, do try and prevent scar tissue reforming. And there's a variety of ways of doing this. So in terms of post-operative care, we'll give them a dose of steroids intraoperatively, but we usually don't continue it post-operatively. However, if they have a tracheotomy tube, we often will use steroid antibiotic combination drops down their trach tube for a week or so afterwards. Ideally, put three drops down the trach tube, then put on a passi muir valve so as they cough or talk, the drops are driven up through the area you've dilated. Mm. 
And we do it just like an ear, three drops three times a day for a week, pretty much. Um, and like an ear, we tend to actually use ear drops because it's convenient. In America, we've got a drop called Cipridex, um, which is a quinolone antibiotic and dexamethasone, and that's been a, a very useful drug for us. But there are obviously other alternatives to that. Um, it's been useful enough for us that if the child doesn't have a tracheotomy tube, we nebulize it. And so, um, you know, highly off-label, but nebulizing eardrops can be quite effective. Well, I think that's uh, it's been a, a comprehensive discussion on the topic. Um, the last part we'll do is the final word. It's an opportunity for you to either raise a point that we haven't discussed or to reflect on maybe a key issue that we have discussed. So over to you for the final word. I think the sort of the bigger picture aspect of this is that I'm, I'm fundamentally an open airway surgeon. I do a lot of slide tracheoplasties, laryngotracheal reconstructions, uh, cricotracheal resections. Our hospital does about 160 om major open airway surgeries a year. And when we started this, we really didn't dilate. It wasn't working well for us. We were using endotracheal tubes, bougies, and the results weren't great. And it's now got to the point where rather than thinking, should we balloon dilate, the thought process is, why wouldn't you balloon dilate? Because the risk of causing harm is low and the potential benefit is significant. And so balloon dilation may complement an open airway procedure or it may replace an open airway procedure. And in that sense, our mode of doing business has changed enormously in the last decade due to the advent of the airway balloon dilator. Well, thanks very much, Mike. Thanks uh, to everyone for listening. Please look for other ENT Expert Opinion podcasts available on the website entexpertopinion.com and we can be contacted by email at entexpertopinion at gmail.com. Thank you.